Jeffrey Smart is one of Australia's most important artists. Internationally acclaimed, and an expatriate South Australian, Smart was an unrepentant figurative painter in a period when abstract expressionism was in vogue. Smart is known for a style called precisionism. His subject matter is the city and its industries, factories, and road signs, and his works are full of private jokes and playful allusions. His canvases are brightly colored, geometric and structural, with an eerie sense of timelessness and stillness that catches you by surprise. Geoffrey Smart was born in Adelaide, South Australia, in 1921, and was the only son of Francis Isaac Smart, a real estate agent and his second wife, Emmeline Edson. He first traveled to Europe when he was a child of four, but after the Great Depression destroyed his father's business, life became more confined. He started drawing early, and from the age of twelve, he attended Saturday drawing classes. During his high school years, he studied at Pulteney Grammar School and Unley High School in Adelaide. He attended Pulteney on a cathedral choir scholarship and attempted the intermediate certificate in 1936, but was unsuccessful. Smart's early fascination with man-made structures, rather than nature, convinced him that he should become an architect, but when his father's real estate business collapsed during the 1930s Depression, his parents couldn't afford to send him to university, so he trained as an art teacher instead. In the late 1930s, Smart studied part-time at the South Australian School of Arts and Crafts, where he received his first instruction in oil painting. At the same time, he also trained at the Adelaide Teachers College, from 1939 to 1941. He then taught art at Goodwood Boys Technical School from 1942, and also taught part-time at the School of Arts and Crafts from 1945 to 1947. He joined the Royal South Australian Society of Arts around 1941, and exhibited with them from then on. He was elected vice president of the society in 1950. Smart's visit to the studio of Adelaide School of Arts and Crafts teacher, Dorrit Black in 1941 had a strong influence on him. Black, who was a prolific painter and printmaker, showed Smart how to compose a scene based on the mathematical principles of the golden mean, which gave Smart's distinctive painting style a defining sense of geometry and unity. One of Smart's most powerful early drawings, a figure study of 1942 that began as a conventional nude, but changed into a mosaic of cubist shapes, was influenced by Black's teaching. It was the only cubist work he ever produced. Smart began exhibiting in group shows in the early 1940s, and had his first solo exhibition at Kosminski Gallery in Melbourne in 1944. The show was opened by Robert Menzies, Prime Minister of Australia from 1939 to 1941. Menzies went on to serve another term between 1949 and 1966. Smart always regarded his early paintings in Adelaide as a warm-up phase for greater things to come. But they reveal the direction of his thinking, and foreshadow the themes and influences that appeared in his more mature art. We can see the awkwardness in compositions, such as Hindley Street at Evening, painted in 1943, and Port Adelaide Railway Station, which quickly give way to the formal rigour of paintings, like water towers. The absence of any human presence in this early work is a notable feature. Water Towers, painted in 1944, differs from Smart's later paintings, which are usually about the relationship of the individual to the environment, where he relies on figures to provide a sense of scale. Here, there is an eerie absence of any activity other than the mechanical. Water Towers shows life and activity through industrialization, rather than a human presence. The smoke and steam theme continues in the elegant, Keswick siding, painted in 1945. None of these are pretty pictures, but they exude a tough kind of poetry, technically accomplished with a judicious balance between thin washes and heavy impasto. In them, we can recognize Smart's focus on alienation, which he would use for the rest of his life. 
Features that are characteristic of the best in Smart's art make an early appearance in these paintings. His mastery of composition is present, as is his ability to discover drama in the commonplace, and translate ordinary objects into metaphors. It is this edge that gives his work such vitality. Over the next few years, Smart extended his subject matter beyond Adelaide, starting with two paintings on the Wasteland theme in 1945. In The Wasteland 2, Smart began to develop his remote vision of the urban landscape. The desolate rural view in this picture is inspired by T.S. Eliot's poem of the same name, which is about brokenness and loss. Eliot's description of a world which has lost its human heart, and Smart's lonely figures, adrift in urban wastelands, appear to be strongly related. Smart continues the loneliness theme with Robe and Cape Dombey, which he painted after a summer holiday on the coast while traveling between Adelaide and Melbourne. In these works, a growing strength of design is evident. There is even a hint of theatrical grandeur, such as in Kapunda Mines, shown here, with its Cornish architecture, and salute to the influence of another Australian artist, Russell Drysdale. Smart's paintings catch you unaware with their candor, and the way in which the artist sees things afresh. The heightened realism, exactness of detail, and the detachment, speak quietly of the surreal that underlies so much of Smart's art. This work so impressed the National Gallery of Victoria, that they purchased it in 1947. This painting, Sunday Morning Service, was included in Smart's joint exhibition with his friend, fellow South Australian artist Jacqueline Hick, held at the David Jones Art Gallery, Sydney in 1946. Many of his best works from the period were on show, including Keswick Siding, now in the collection of the Art Gallery of New South Wales, and Wasteland One, and Kapunda Mines, both now in the National Gallery of Victoria. In Sunday morning service, the horizon is long and low, in the best surrealist tradition, heightening the isolation of the church in the vastness of the countryside. Everything is utterly still. The people, the car and the bike are motionless in an atmosphere of expectation and piercing clarity. Trees are rarely seen in Geoffrey Smart's artworks, but as Smart claimed, an artist has to be moved himself, to move his viewers, and Smart was moved by the man-made, and not interested in typical Australian landscapes. In 1948, Smart worked his way on a long, arduous journey to Europe by cargo ship to begin a work-study tour. He travelled to the UK via the United States. Arriving in London on a tight budget, he met with his friend, the painter Jacqueline Hick, then travelled to France, where he was joined by Australian painter, Michael Shannon. In Paris he studied at the Académie La Grande Chaumère. The school, which was devoted to painting and sculpture, did not teach according to the strict academic rules of painting. An added attraction was the low fees. It was said that all the school really provided was a model, and warmth in the winter. Later, he attended the Académie Montmartre, studying under artist Fernand Léger for six months. At the time, Léger's style was largely based on his earlier cubist and abstract influences, and in his opinion, Smart had already been ruined by conservative Australian art teaching. As time passed, it became clear that there was some affinity between the precise composition of Smart's work and the simplified monumental forms of the French master. This tightly controlled placement of compositional elements was to become increasingly imaginative in Smart's paintings. Smart later said, As my technique grew, I found I could paint those things I enjoyed looking at, like those slum streets, behind the city apartments. Throughout this period, Smart travelled in Europe with Australian artist friends, including Michael Shannon, Jacqueline Hick, Donald Friend, and Margaret Salento. His travels gave him the opportunity to view and study the work of artists he admired, in particular, Paul Cezanne, Piero della Francesca, Rogier van der Weyden, Giovanni Bellini, and Titian. While in France, Smart visited Cézanne's studio in Aix. 
Smart had a basic respect for Cezanne's structured procedure and the French master's firm belief in painting against all distractions. In 1950, Smart and his artist friends lived together in Italy, in an old house on the island of Ischia in the Bay of Naples. This work, painted at the time, is a view of the village of St. Angelo. The group's self-indulgent lifestyle at the time, while not particularly conducive to a disciplined artistic practice, had a lasting significance for Geoffrey Smart, who would later return to live permanently in Italy. Finally, with his finances dwindling rapidly, Smart accepted his parents' offer of support towards the cost of a passage home, and embarked for Australia. He was back in Adelaide by the end of 1950. But his intention to live in Sydney for ten years to gather his resources, then move to Italy, was still on track. Smart didn't paint many self-portraits, but this one, made after staying on the island of Procida off the coast of Naples, encapsulates the elements of style for which he would become known, surrealism, precision, and a dream-like atmosphere. The sky is dark. His face, a portrait within a portrait, is neutral. There are seemingly unrelated but precisely placed objects scattered around, and, in the distance, a mysterious and out-of-place figure, a woman in an orange dress. Smart, a young determined artist, looks out intently at the viewer. On Smart's return to Adelaide, he painted his largest work to date, as a submission for the Commonwealth Jubilee Art Prize. It was Wallaroo, showing a scene from the daily life of the copper mining town on the coast of the Spencer Gulf, and featuring similar Cornish-style buildings to those seen earlier in his 1946 painting Kapunda Mines. In spite of prominently featuring two fishermen carrying a boat ashore in the foreground, the work is permeated with a feeling of solitude, reminiscent of paintings by Giorgio de Chirico. Smart had already left Adelaide for Sydney, when he was announced the winner of the competition, and was pleased to receive the generous prize money of £500. During the early 50s, Smart exhibited at the Macquarie Galleries, while developing his distinctive, slightly surreal view of the city as a desert of human emotions. In his Sydney paintings, Smart began to include figures within his architectural settings, more often than he had in his earlier works. He also began to crop the picture, creating the impression of moving in on the subject. Dark skies now provided a dramatic backdrop to the action. However, his first couple of years in Sydney were a struggle, as his paintings were not selling. Money was short, and he found it difficult to find a place big enough to live in comfortably, and to work. Finally, he took a job as an art teacher at the King's School Parramatta, to get enough money to live on. Never having enough time to concentrate on his painting, he began to doubt himself. Smart lived in Sydney for the next 12 years. During this period, he also worked as an art critic for the Daily Telegraph newspaper, as a life-drawing teacher at East Sydney Technical College, and as the arts correspondent for the ABC Children's radio program The Argonauts Club. Smart's surreal and quiet urban streetscapes must have seemed utterly alien to the man in the street at the time. He always felt that he was swimming against the tide. He was a modernist in Adelaide at a time when conventional taste held firm to Hans Heysen and the so-called Gum Tree School. Later, in Sydney, where Smart worked as a figurative painter, abstraction became the latest trend. His commitment to a realistic style of painting made him seem old-fashioned and conservative, leading to his omission from at least one important survey of Australian art. He grew tired of listening to friends encouraging him to loosen up. This was when his palette shifted, to what one critic described as an increased focus on the uncanny and the theatrical. Two important small paintings that he created in the mid-fifties, Approaching Storm by Railway and The Nun's Picnic, were a sign that he was beginning to understand what kind of painter he wanted to be. In both these works, as in Kapunda Mines, the color of the sky has been reduced almost to black, nudging them towards the realm of not quite of this world. In one, 
a pram stands stranded on a stretch of dazzlingly illuminated grass. In the other, two nuns sit on an ochre-brown escarpment, strewn with rocks, in the old gold-mining town of Hill End. The dark, unsettled sky imparts a sense of drama. Smart later claimed he had no emotional or symbolic agenda when creating these works, but the two compositions transmit a feeling of uneasiness about human existence that usually appears only in horror stories. A kind of ironic abstraction would soon begin to develop in his work as he depicted a dehumanized modern world. In many of his later paintings, colorful modern road signs, vehicles and architectural details lock together in a bold abstract pattern. Nature is made to imitate art in these paintings, and the components of the actual world mutate into harsh graphic designs. In the early 1960s, Smart began to prize open the envelope of social commentary through erotic themes played out against the backdrops of graffiti-covered walls, grassy slopes, bathing sheds and boardwalks. Male and female flesh, poised in the sunlight, waiting for something to happen. On the roof, Taylor Square, painted in 1961, is a portrait of passive sensuality. A female nude drenched in sunlight, slumbering within a small symphony of rectangles held firm by the golden mean. This image, demonstrating Smart's figure drawing ability, led to him being invited to teach life drawing at East Sydney Technical College, later to become the National Art School. He was the drawing teacher there between 1962 and 1963. At the time, he was also invited to show in international group exhibitions in London, first at the Whitechapel Gallery in 1961, and then at the Tate in 1963. During an especially prolific period in the 1960s, Smart produced two of his most famous works, Coogee Baths, shown here, and his celebrated Cahill Expressway painted in 1962. This picture shows a portly, bald-headed man with one arm, standing by the side of a road that curves into a tunnel. One level above, there is a monument from which a figure stretches out an arm to the heavens. With its modern office blocks, and street lighting, we know we are in a big city, but it's as if a lockdown is taking place. Aside from the fat man, who looks like film director Alfred Hitchcock, the streets are completely deserted. The scene is as stark and melancholy as one of Giorgio de Chirico's lonely piazzas, or a bare urban vista by American painter, Edward Hopper. The upward curve of the road frames the figure like a proscenium arch, or a drawn-back curtain. The theatricality of the painting suggests an obscured reality that exists in the shadows. The work has a timeless quality, and a feeling of isolation, like many of Smart's works. But many of his other paintings are also ironic, or wittily detached, as well as amusing and serene. These ambiguities are preferences that go to the very heart of the artist's temperament. The doubts and insecurities that stayed with Smart during his life, and his notorious unwillingness to discuss the meaning of the content of his work, reveal something about the artist as a person. In these paintings, we can see the beginning of Smart's mature style, which is characterized by an increased hyper-clarity and meticulously crafted compositions. But these works were painted at a difficult time in Smart's life. In his memoir he says, By 1963, I was feeling like throwing it all in, before I cracked up. My emotional life was in a mess. Smart later experienced a breakdown, in which he felt so dissociated from himself, it seemed an out-of-body experience. Shortly after this low ebb, Smart gave what he called self-therapeutic painting classes at Sydney's Callan Park Asylum for patients convalescing from mental illness. The year 1963 was a crucial one for Geoffrey Smart. He resumed his travels around Europe and moved to Rome with his boyfriend. Australian artist Ian Bent. The apartment they settled in was across the river from Rome's old medieval area. Smart's return to Italy was to be permanent, he lived there for the rest of his life. Nevertheless, he regarded himself as an Australian living abroad, 
and he carried an Australian passport. He was a dedicated correspondent, and kept in touch with many Australian artists and curators by way of letters and fax, as well as by phone, and frequent visits. He continued to exhibit in Australia, where he enjoyed ongoing popular and critical success. Throughout the 1960s and 1970s, Smart's artistic career gained momentum, thanks to prominent solo shows and exhibitions in his homeland of Australia and around the world. These included the 1967 solo exhibition at the Redfern Gallery in London and the American touring group show The Australian Painters, 1964-1966. Smart reveled in the historic aspects of Italy, together with the contrasts between ancient, dense layers of urban dwellings and the industrial constructions of the modern era. Street signs, apartment blocks, and construction sites became his subject matter. He confronted this universe of technology and architecture, anywhere his travels took him, declaring it was beautiful, and, he became its most passionate poet. Remarkably, it was only in 1965, when the self-doubting Smart was 44, that he convinced himself that his paintings were finally getting somewhere. The arrival of the photographic realism trend in the art world really swung things Smart's way. It started as an offshoot of pop art, in which the modern world was painted in crisp, photograph-like images. Later, photorealism would morph, during the 1990s, into hyperrealism, with its disturbingly lifelike and often gigantic sculptures of body parts, a trend that still remains current today. One of Smart's favorites, The Listeners, painted in his precisionist style in 1965, shows a young man lying in a field of grass, overshadowed by a giant radar antenna. Here, Smart shows the visual contrasts between modern technology and nature between the golden grass, the red radar and the dark black sky. Outskirts of Parma, shown here, was completed shortly after Smart settled in Italy. While established in his mature style, he continued to make sketches from life, a practice which was integral to his process of seeing and revealing the world, by sketching. Smart would gradually develop preliminary drawings for his paintings, experimenting with placement and economy of form, as well as color, light and shadow. Here, his familiar ubiquitous apartment buildings make their way into the environment. Smart's Dampier paintings were conceived during a trip back to Australia in 1966, on a commission for mining giant, Rio Tinto, to paint a picture at the company's new iron ore mine at the Mount Tom Price. While there, Smart also visited the associated port facility at Dampier, resulting in three paintings of the area. In each of these works, Smart appears in the guise of Piero, a clown who is the fall guy for other people's pranks. He is also a symbol for putting on a mask to hide one's true feelings or opinions. In Dampier too, Piero's naked companion is Ian Bent, Smart's boyfriend at the time. The body language between the two suggests they might be having a problem. Smart's relocation to Italy saw a lightening of his palette and a joyous celebration of light, with the contrasting geometry of the blocky shapes of the modern world and the human scale of the old. The general mood of this work, morning practice buyer, is decidedly upbeat, even triumphant. We see an acrobat, perhaps from a nearby circus, expertly juggling a large yellow cube with his feet. Smart, who was usually quick to point out defects in his own work, called Morning Practice one of the best paintings he had done. In the early 1970s, Smart found his ideal environment to work, moving from Rome to a Tuscan farmhouse, near Arezzo. Smart was 49 when he and Bent purchased the property. Thereafter, it became the base for his many travels. Significantly, Smart never really disowned Australia, and often returned to his country of birth, describing himself as an Australian who lives overseas. His home in Tuscany became a travel magnet for visiting Australians and expats living in Italy and elsewhere in Europe. Smart never fully acclimatized to Italy, he spoke Italian poorly, 
but loved the ambience of the place. He once famously described himself as a European with an Australian passport. In his autobiography, Not Quite Straight, Smart observed, this environment is conducive to work. In my frequent forays to Arezzo and Florence, I see a lot of the modern world, which I like to paint. After breaking up with Bent, Smart shared his Tuscan villa's congenial domesticity with a person who would remain his major life partner for the next 35 years, the Gippsland-born, Yale Master of Arts, happily turned Tuscan farmer, Hermes de Zan. While living and working in Sydney, Smart had introduced into his work the rather stolid, fat, balding gentleman who would subsequently reappear as a kind of everyman. Smart referred to him as Mr. T.S. Eugenides, and he may be a Hitchcock-style, walk-on cameo, standing in for the painter, and taking on a variety of roles. This painting, The Traveller, painted in 1973, is a good example of Smart's use of this figure. The man stands in a slightly claustrophobic space between two buses, with a block of anonymous worker housing apartments behind. He emerges from one bus to be confronted by another, poignantly suggesting the lost, dislocated existence of humanity in the modern world. A sense of resigned waiting fills the canvas. Looking at this paintings, it's easy to see how much thought has gone into every tiny detail. Nothing is left to chance in Smart's pictures, shapes and forms are repeated in many different guises, textures and colors are carefully chosen. Smart believed that art was for the eye, and not the head. In the dome, shown here, a red and white stick, set at a jaunty angle, is compositionally no less important than the looming form of St. Peter's Basilica, behind it. And, Smart's paintings are full of sudden surprises, such as the girl in a pink dress running in front of a green barricade in this painting. Or the outlandish red radar dish, towering over the suburban skyline in rooftops. Smart's works generate a sense of mystery. Elements are often partially obscured from view, or else creating startling juxtapositions of scale. Figures are observed as though caught in time, and a sense of the absurd pervades these apparently innocuous scenes. With these works, Smart startles us into a sudden awareness of just how strange, and marvelous, the world can really be. Starting from the 1970s, Smart dedicated himself to interpreting the landscape of modern Italy in his own unique style. When asked why he painted highways and signs while surrounded by the beauty of the Tuscan countryside, Smart explained that he liked to paint the modern world, which he found exciting. Like the best of Smart's achievements, the Arezzo turn-off too, is infinitely suggestive, but reveals nothing. Although his works have often been described as bleak commentaries, on a society alienated by technology, Jeffrey Smart had no such feelings for his art. He insisted that he found the world of cars, roads, factories and airports beautiful, and his paintings reflected the world as he saw it. I like living in the 21st century, he said. To me the world has never been more beautiful. I am trying to paint the world that I live in, as beautifully as I can. In 1973, the Arezzo Turnoff II was unveiled at Smart's solo exhibition at the Rudy Komen Gallery in Sydney. The display of 14 major canvases and eight studies was applauded as his most ambitious and comprehensive to date. In 2021, the Arezzo Turnoff II sold at a Melbourne auction for $1.35 million. In the late 1970s, after years of living in Italy, the rather monochromatic Australian dustiness of Smart's early paintings had been replaced by a clinically sharp focus and pure colour. Smart painted brilliant pictures of road signs, starting with the guiding spheres 2 and its departing trucks. It was followed by Autobahn in the Black Forest 1 and 2, where Smart gives full focus to signage in a feast of diagonals. A symphony in red and white stripes, with subtle variations in a pinkish mauve, even the tall trees of the forest can't compete with the man-made splendor depicted here. In these pictures, 
Smart's images are so intensely presented that they take on the super real. Here, he makes the commonplace extraordinary. He delights in visual games, the directional signs are not quite straight. On some, angles are reversed in a tug of war, setting up a contradiction between a spiral movement and utter stillness. The boards create an illusion of depth as they appear to recede into the distance. In 2011, his autobahn in the Black Forest 2 sold for just over $1 million at auction in Melbourne. While the use of the prominent diagonal can be traced back to another major work, End of the Outer Strata, painted in 1968, Autobahn in the Black Forest 2, where no trucks or figures intrude, intrigues us, because it is so splendidly minimalistic. Smart's paintings show us a visual world, distilled to its essentials, prompting us to look as if for the first time, at the elusive obvious, the wonderfully strange, and the strangely wonderful things, that daily surround us. Jeffrey Smart often felt let down by Australian art museums. When the Australian National Gallery opened in 1982, he attended the ceremonies but was disappointed by the poor representation of his work. Smart felt he was paying the penalty for swimming against the tide. He had no interest in the Australiana associated with artists such as Nolan, Boyd, Tucker, and Olson. And, he had no sympathy for the tides of abstract and conceptual art that dominated the 1960s and 70s. Resolutely figurative, he was a painter of the modern urban world, not the bush, or the mythical past. A typical Geoffrey Smart painting could have been set in Italy, or Australia. His images were cool and oblique, devoid of obvious emotion. The art institutions may have found him old-fashioned and reactionary, but the public has always admired his work. Smart's early classics, such as Corrugated Geoconda, painted in 1976, bring to the fore subject matter that is familiar, even predictable, but it is transfigured into something slightly strange, unnerving and enigmatic. His technique of painting is loving, and exacting, and, as he got older, it became more meticulous, and more painstakingly precise. In this painting, we see the juxtaposition of the commonplace with the revered. A couple of green palm tree heads look over a corrugated fence, covered with peeling posters and graffiti. The Mona Lisa smiles out at us from an advertising poster. On the bottom left, Smart has drawn a heart with an arrow through it, J.S. loves E.D., affirming his commitment to his new boyfriend, Hermes Dazan. A modern airport control tower is a very contemporary structure, part of a world that did not exist before the 20th century. In this work, Smart has painted a thrusting tower, topped by an observation room, a voluminous red brick circular building, and the tiny roof of a pink high-rise very low in the background. Everything has an intense focus, with the front of the tower in sunlight. Smart's paintings convey a rich sense of optimism, despite their occasional uncertainties. A poignant reminder that the things which seem upon first glance to reflect a brutality to the soul can become, ironically, a source of wonder. Jacob Descending, is one of Jeffrey Smart's more dreamlike images. It presents a pink spiral staircase, containing a descending suited male figure. Smart may have been influenced by the biblical tale of Jacob's ladder, as a symbol of the connection between heaven and earth, when he created this work. The staircase leading to nowhere, and the descending balding businessman, are examples of a particular atmosphere Smart could bring to his paintings. They are delightful urban follies, with an edge of something darker, almost dystopian. Perhaps most interesting, is that he allows his figures to just go about their day, strolling through the city, without drama, untroubled by the weirdness of their situation. For smart, geometry and the precision of the composition is the key to successful art. Some of smart's works have evolved from the need to meet his client's requirements. Container train in landscape, possibly smart's largest work at 10 meters wide, was commissioned for the Victorian Arts Council. Smart had run out of ideas for the required, very wide and narrow mural, and was ready to call it quits. While on holiday, 
he and Dazan were held up at a railway crossing, while a train passed by. As the train, hauling hundreds of containers of different colors, threaded its way through the trees, Smart suddenly realized that this was the mural he was looking for. The result was Container Train in Landscape, painted in 1983. As always, Smart's hard-edged brilliance is imbued with an elusive quality of compositional repose, of silence and stillness, broken here, only by the imagined clatter of the train, as it passes through the trees, lining the country road. While most of Smart's works are landscapes, in the 1980s and 90s, he produced some of his most humorous and satisfying works, self-portraits, and portraits of his friends. Smart, who never accepted commissions, was often reluctant to produce portraits of individuals who he secretly believed already had an overinflated sense of self-worth. He strived to ensure that their figure was just part of the composition, rather than the only element in his painting. In this work, the scholarly writer, David Maloof, is shown as a workman in overalls, holding a twisting orange pipe. Here, the word on the building in the background refers to Maloof's recently published novel, An Imaginary Life, which is based on the exile of the ancient Roman poet Ovid. The orange pipe is said to represent Maloof's act of creativity, although Smart was never willing to reveal his motivations, preferring the viewer to find their own interpretation of his works. In his portrait of Germaine Greer, the author of 1970's book, The Female Eunuch, Smart places Greer on a chair at the side of the frame, with a graffitied wall behind her, handbag on lap, looking thoroughly uncomfortable. The roughly painted and textured wall could be a comment on the subject's character, or perhaps a response to those who considered he was lacking in technical skill as a painter. Later, commenting on the painting, Greer applauded Smart for having the eyes to see the poetry and beauty of our culture, and to represent it in his paintings. Smart's portrait of Clive James shows the Australian journalist, broadcaster and writer, standing on an overpass, small and isolated within the iron and cement structures of the city. The fence is based on a motif Smart saw in Japan. It's really a portrait of a yellow fence, and Clive is the figure in the composition. Faced with the suggestion that his figures expressed the alienation of modern urban man, Smart said that he introduced the human figure into his work only to give an idea of the scale of the buildings. This makes sense, but, as in this case, there is an element of mischief-making too. None of Smart's human figures seems at all subdued by massed concrete blocks of flats and offices and multi-lane highways passing through cities, and, least of all, the irrepressible, Clive James. In this painting, Smart shows Australian painter Margaret Ollie, at the Louvre, a place she loved, but she is placed in front of a row of anonymous wooden screens. In notes Smart made while designing the painting, which is dominated by the screens, he wrote. How can I pull the eye over to the left, with a darker tonal figure? Who better than Margaret Ollie? Jeffrey Smart and Margaret Ollie became close friends in the last twenty years of Smart's life. They shared many acquaintances in common, including fellow Australian artists Justin O'Brien and Russell Drysdale. Both Smart and Ollie had a great passion for art and music. They also shared a dry sense of humour. Ollie responded to Smart's painting with her characteristic wit. I am glad Geoffrey put me in the Louvre, she said. I am much more at home there, than on a freeway. Smart was at best, an occasional portraitist, and tended to minimize his subjects in his paintings, rather than making them the center of attention. The exception appears to be when he was painting himself, or his loved ones. Here, in this self-portrait, we see Smart as a pug-faced, puckish figure, in front of a mural showing the year he painted this work. He looks out from the canvas, coolly surveying the world, with a painter's eye. During his lifetime, Geoffrey Smart repeatedly avowed that his only concern was putting the right shapes in the right colors, in the right places, 
and his paintings have often been compared to the Italian films of the 1950s and 60s which typically featured shots composed for poetic effect. Yet Smart's paintings bear a remarkable quality of planned completion that is usually aided by a single dominant feature. In the Reservoir, Centennial Park, painted in 1988, the usual isolated figure is here, weighed down by a heavy bag and the immediate prospect of a further steep climb. The primary colors of her bag, and the clothes of the runners who bound up the steps and stream along the crest of the embankment, contrast with the severity of the environment. Particular elements and moods recur in Smart's works, and here again, a small discovered landscape of apartment buildings appear in the background. This, perhaps, is why Smart's paintings have such lingering appeal. In these precisely painted scenes, we feel everything is clear and legible. Keep looking, and nothing is quite what it seems. The trumpet-playing figure in the oil drums, painted in 1992, seems a reassertion of the human scale, and of human whimsicality, in the face of the modern industrial landscape, while also celebrating that landscape. Smart worked painstakingly on the oil drums, after he first noticed them while driving near Arezzo. But he was unhappy with his first attempts at the easel. Then he added a trumpet player. I remembered years ago in Sydney, at 5 a.m. one morning, being woken by a man playing the trumpet, he said. I watched him, out the window, serenading the dawn. After he added the trumpet player, the painting was resolved. Matisse at Ashford, arguably one of Smart's finest paintings from his later years, was acquired by the Art Gallery of New South Wales in 2007. The repeated motif of an exhibition poster, advertising Matisse cutouts at the Royal Academy London, appears on each platform of Ashford Station, emphasizing Smart's interest in repetition and visual irony. Smart's portraits rarely focus on their primary subject. One exception is the two-up game, showing Hermes de Zan, who became Smart's life partner in 1975. His calm face is backgrounded by the solid geometry of containers on one side, and the fluidity of people playing a game of two-up, on the other. In formal terms, Dazan's image in the foreground balances the composition, but, perhaps Smart is really saying that life, and love, are at best, a game of chance. When asked to explain how he arrived at the subjects for his paintings, Smart said, Sometimes, I'll drive around for months, then, suddenly, I will see something that seizes me. A shape, a combination of shapes, a play of light or shadow. I make rapid sketches, take photographs to capture a moment of inspiration. The angle and intensity of the light, and precise time of day, were always vital for Smart. He preferred morning or afternoon, when the light was side on and clear. He then painstakingly reworked, revised and recomposed everything in the studio, gradually disclosing a distilled ideal of the scene, its illumination becoming fully apparent, and captured in purely plastic terms of color, line and pigment. My paintings are synthetic, in that I move things around, he said. He worked relentlessly, changing the height of buildings and colors, to get the composition right. Smart liked his paintings being left to speak for themselves. He made it a principle to not explain his art verbally, much to the chagrin of art critics, journalists and documentary makers. Any direct question as to the meaning of a work was pushed aside. His audience was thus able to create their own story. Jeffrey Smart was a widely traveled gregarious man, with sky-blue eyes and a quick, if on occasions, caustic wit. He was a bon vivant, who loved classical music, and his pug dogs. He was well versed in literature and history, and could quote poetry in a way that seems almost inconceivable in an age of smartphones and social media. He was however, above all a disciplined artist, who dedicated a fixed time every day to his work. A perfectionist, he painted slowly and meticulously, producing only a handful of pieces every couple of years. He painted, and overpainted, 
believing no picture was ever truly finished, only abandoned. He even retouched some of his paintings, many years after he had abandoned them. Smart's autobiography, Not Quite Straight, was published in 1996. It is not meant to be a scholarly work. Its puckish breeziness flies in with the title, which refers to a whim of Smart's father, an Adelaide land developer, who named a certain Jeffrey Street after his newborn son in 1921. But, as Smart related, the street had an odd little bend to it, then he added, the kink is still there, but softened by age. Smart's memoir is an agreeable read, chatty, witty and intelligent. It is also very honest about coming to terms with his homosexuality, even relating how, as a young adolescent, he removed his clothes to embrace a naked bronze statue of Hercules in a public park. Smart said, when I read Proust ten years later, I was tremendously moved to read he had done the same thing when he was young. In 1999, the Art Gallery of New South Wales held a major retrospective of his work. In the same year, Smart was awarded an honorary doctorate from the University of Sydney, and, in 2011, the University of South Australia, did the same. In 2001, Smart was appointed Officer of the Order of Australia, for his services to visual art, and his encouragement offered to young artists. In the same year, Smart held concurrent exhibitions at the at Philip Bacon Galleries in Brisbane, and at Australian Galleries in Sydney. The Brisbane exhibition was of his most recent work, and the Sydney exhibition was of his drawings and studies, from 1942 through to 2001. In 2011, when he was 89 years old, and confined to a wheelchair, Smart announced his retirement. It was however, short-lived, as he soon became fascinated by the subject of what would be his last work, Labyrinth. Labyrinth is one of Smart's most enigmatic works. It shows a person, towards the end of his life, caught within a construction from which there is no escape. Some of the brushwork lacks the refinement of Smart's best works, but as Smart said, it's the light that counts, the light on objects can make them beautiful, even if they're unappealing in themselves. The work is of strict compositional exactness, yet full of wit and ambiguity. If the painting is metaphorical, then perhaps Smart always belonged in this maze, his predicament described in the words of a T.S. Eliot poem, the end of all our exploring, will be to arrive at where we started, and know the place, for the first time. There is no easy solution to the enigma of the labyrinth, but as we get to know the painting each of us will have our own convincing interpretation. It is the nature of Smart's art, it is accessible to all, but we will all see it differently. Smart died of renal failure in Arezzo, Italy in June 2013. He was 91 years of age. The funeral was held in a church not far from his home near Arezzo. At the funeral, the church was decorated with huge bouquets of white flowers and greenery. A representative of the Australian ambassador in Rome read a message from the now former Australian Prime Minister, Julia Gillard. The priest and the mayor talked about the unfolding story of Smart's life in a small Italian village, whilst his friends recounted the very humorous, but cynical side of his character. Geoffrey Smart's deep respect for history and culture made him the humblest of artists. Conscious always of the giants that had gone before, he felt the smallness of his own attempts to add another brick to the towering edifice of civilization. If it was the weight of the past that generated many of Smart's insecurities, he turned this anxiety into an artistic virtue. He shared the same capacity for doubt that we see in modern masters, such as Cezanne and Matisse. In embracing doubt, Smart also admitted the possibility of failure, which led to those long, drawn-out sessions in the studio, numerous studies, endless revisions, and diminishing productivity. Geoffrey Smart's work is held in all major collections in Australia, as well as in the international collections of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, New York, the thyssen bornemitza Collection, Switzerland, and the Yale University Art Gallery, Connecticut. To celebrate the centenary of Geoffrey Smart's birth, the National Gallery of Australia in Canberra, 
staged a major retrospective of his work in 2021. Jeffrey Smart is Australia's fifth most traded artist.